Most excellent. So we're reading the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. We're on page 189 in the chapter called The Master's Birthday Celebration at Dakshineshwar. And uh, yeah, we're picking up now in his room. And some devotees are arriving from Konagar. Presently, some devotees from Konagar arrived, singing kirtan to the accompaniment of drums and cymbals. As they reached the northeast veranda of Sri Ramakrishna's room, the master joined in the music, dancing with them, intoxicated with divine joy. Now and then he went into samadhi, standing still as a statue. While he was in one of these states of divine unconsciousness, the devotees put thick garlands of jasmine around his neck. The enchanting form of the master reminded the devotees of Chaitanya, another incarnation of God. The master passed alternatively but through three moods of divine consciousness. The inmost, when he completely lost all knowledge of the outer world. The semi-conscious, when he danced with the devotees in an ecstasy of love. And conscious, when he joined them in loud singing. It was indeed a sight for the gods, to see the master standing motionless in samadhi with fragrant garlands hanging from his neck, his countenance beaming with love, and the devotees singing and dancing around him. That, just a moment. Oops. I got to let somebody in from the room here. So we've got we've got this amazing scene. <laughs> I mean, what an incredible thing to even imagine to, to see Takor just in such an ecstatic joy. I mean, <laughs> I mean, an ecstatic joy. That's like laughing so hard you can't breathe. That's that's ecstatic joy, and for him to be dancing and singing and going into samadhi simultaneously. Uh, with the devot to the devotees music that have shown up this little band of devotees that are just traveling around doing uh, playing spiritual music and they show up at Dakshineshwar and just to have him run out and join them and begin dancing and singing and going into samadhi just this you know this is this is what spiritual life is this is what the real deal is uh, you know not this somber <laughs> you know bummer i have to repent kind of thing but but this joy of life touching your nature you know the fruit of your spiritual life the 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 end game of our practice is exactly this exactly this and forever <laughs> so it's quite quite a delicious scene happening here when it was time for his noon meal sri ramakrishna put on a new yellow cloth and sat on the small couch his golden complexion, blending with his yellow cloth, enchanted the eyes of the devotees. After his meal, Sri Ramakrishna rested a little on a small couch, inside and outside his room, crowded with devotees, among them Kedar, Shuresh, Ram, Manamohan, Gurindra, Rakal, Bhavanat, and M, Rakal's father, was also present. A Vaishnava Goswami was seated in the room. The master said to him, well, what do you say? What is the way? Goswami, sir, the chanting of God's name is enough. The scriptures emphasize the sanctity of God's name for the Kali Yuga. Master, yes, there is no doubt about the sanctity of God's name. But can a mere name achieve anything without the yearning of love of the devotee behind it? One should feel great restlessness of soul for the vision of God. Suppose a man repeats the name of God mechanically while his mind is absorbed in woman and gold. Can he achieve anything? Mere muttering of magic words doesn't cure one of the pain of a spider or a scorpion sting. One must also apply the smoke of burning cow dung. <laughs> That's probably what's missing in all of your spiritual lives some smoke from some cow dung. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed, it could be, who knows. <laughs> but you didn't hear it from me. So this 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 wonderful the, the sanctity of God's name there's no doubt of the power in that. 
But this rotely saying, you know, of course, mother counters this a little bit. You know, she says, if you're, whether you're thrown into the Ganges or you jump into the Ganges, you're going to get wet. So there is some value to just rotely saying the name, but not like he's saying, with your mind dwelling uh, on your vices, with your mind dwelling on things that are the opposite of your spiritual life. That won't work. <laughs> so that's what he's saying here. This is that, that, you know, mother says that, that if you have even like, like threading a needle, if there's even one fiber sticking out, that thread won't go through the needle. And she said, those fibers are your desires. So we really do have to work on our discernment and our, our discrimination uh, so that we can get to the point of a stable renunciation as we turn toward the light, as we turn toward the divine and really gather all the forms of our love, all the little pieces of our love that we've sent off to objects and people and relationships and ideas and hopes and dreams. Uh, if we can come to realize through our discernment that all of our hopes and dreams are fulfilled in God, that all of the desires for objects in this world are fulfilled in the divine, uh, and that it's his sparkling name, her sparkling name in every one of those objects that attracts us to them. And so through this discernment, we, we manage to, to bring all of the fibers into alignment so that we can thread this needle. And of course, the secret is, and Mother doesn't share that part because it's a surprise later when you show up, is that the eye of the needle is this big around because of grace. <laughs> and so you'll do all this work to get all of your, your fibers all neatly in line. And then you get there and realize several of them are sticking out and you're all fretting as you're getting to the gates of <laughs> that holy city. And Mother gives you a needle with like a three-foot hole at the top. And you're like, whoa, cool. <laughs> Not only can I thread it, I can walk through it. So this idea of chanting God's name, that's that source of grace, that presence of the beloved uh, within. And even chanting that name, even, even if it is done uh, in a less than perfect way, it is the presence. It does invoke the presence of the divine. And to begin to pay attention to that, to begin to open to that and see that uh, is, it is the beginning of that divine love. It will, it will bring and, and that love to the surface because love begets love and the divine name always invokes love because God is love. And so by invoking that divine name, you're invoking uh, your source of love within the love that you have for all of the things that you've done and searched for and longed for in life comes from that one source. And so speaking that name and sitting in the presence of what is invoked, that pure love, that divine love, uh, will evoke that response within your ego self, within your, your particular self, in response, will provoke that love. And that's why we say in bhakti, you know, you sit there and you imagine God in your mind. And that image of God is just a concept. You know, if God can't fit in the mind. And then you have an idea of yourself, which also is a, a horribly inadequate and, and, and shrouded in misunderstanding. So you've got this imperfect idea of yourself and you've got this conceptual idea, uh, emaciated idea of God on the other hand. But what happens between them is that since God is the ideal and, and you are that, and you sit there contemplating this, div this divine relationship between these two emaciated, <laughs> impractical, certainly inaccurate concepts of both yourself and God, what happens is that you don't merge into your imperfect concept of God and, and, and the imperfect concept of God doesn't expand. What happens is that God pulls in a, a sneak switch on you because God is actually the love that grows between you and your chosen ideal. And in that love, both your inadequate vision of God and your, your wrong idea of self become absorbed in this pure love that has developed through your contemplating and knowing and becoming intimate with this presence of the beloved within, within ourself. And that's how we find our unity. That's how we find our true nature uh, slipped in like that, you know, from a completely unexpected 
angle, that that love consumes you. And we see what happens here in Takor's dancing and singing. That's the size of the love uh, that comes between you and your chosen ideal as you do your practice. And in time, as those impurities fall away, the inhibitions fall away, your trust in grace uh, matures, your ability to forgive yourself matures, your awareness of the moment matures, and the thing that comes from all of that is this overwhelming sense of love, this overwhelming sense of unity, of perfection, of safety and refuge. Goswami, the one who just said that just chanting the name of God was enough, and Takor gave him, of course, that correction there, but then he says, but what about Ajamila then? He was a great sinner. There was no sin that he had not indulged in. But he uttered the name of Narayana on his deathbed, calling his son also who had that name, and thus he was liberated, the master. Well, perhaps Ajamila had done some spiritual things in his past birth. It is also said that he once practiced austerity. Besides, those were the last moments of his life. What is the use of giving an elephant a bath? It will cover itself with dirt and dust again to become its former self. But if someone removes the dust from the, from the body and gives it a bath just before it enters the stable, well, then the elephant's going to remain clean. So this, <laughs> this is how that works. Because I've often heard that if you chant the name of God at the, at the time of death, that you, you have your salvation, you have your, your, your freedom. And, uh, you know, but at the, at the end of, the, of your death, wh where is your mind going to be? It's going to be at the sum total of your life. So if you haven't been chanting the name of God, at least at some level during your life, you're certainly not going to be doing it at the end of it. You know, your mind will be caught in all the things that you've loved, and it will be caught in missing and contemplating missing all of the things that you're preparing to leave. You know, the sorrow of, of leaving your husband or wife behind, the sadness of leaving children behind. The, perhaps the, the feeling of you never really accomplished what you wanted to accomplish in life or how sorry you are you're not going to be there for the dog's birthday this year. You know, all of these, all of these little things that are our, our attachments, you know, unfortunately, that's what we think of when we're preparing to leave, when we're pre preparing to close up shop. And so even though this seems like an easy answer, uh, to be to have the grace to be able to chant the name of God at the time of death is from is from a, a life that's been living with that ideal in front of it. It comes from a heart that has been anticipating that moment uh, of of that divine communion. You know, so so what you're doing now uh, will uh, will bring you to that chanting of the beloved name. And I can only imagine, I, I, as a practice, quite often, I, uh, <laughs> quite often means every now and then, where I, and, and I'll lay down in bed and try and duplicate what Ramana Maharshi did, you know, where he imagined his own death. And uh, in my own mind, I sit there and try to imagine what the, of what I'm experiencing at this moment is going to disappear with the body. I mean, what, what is going to be left? And so I kind of slowly just work through everything that I experience in that moment and just realize, okay, no, that's not going to be there. Okay, that's that's probably also going to go away. It's going to be pure witness. I'm not going to be able to think anything most likely because I would imagine that comes from brain. You know, I won't have any senses at that moment, I assume, because, you know, they are they're tied to the body. And so I just slowly, one by one, watch this, watch this come out. And uh, I think it's just going to be an amazing experience. Uh, I just, it's just going to be amazing, I think, to, to go through that process of separating out from the body and uh, leaving it behind and, and to, at that point, come to the realization of, of what is and isn't of the body and uh, what is and isn't of the world and of the mind. Uh, it's going to be such a such an amazing unfolding, such an amazing journey, and I think it's going to be so familiar to us uh, because of practice. We're going to see the truths that we've been studying and not understanding maybe for all of these years, but we're going to begin to see them solidify 
right in front of us, right before us. And that notion of like, you know, the body's gone and you're still there. You're going to be like, well, I'll be, look at this. The body's gone, but I'm still, I'm still, oh my God, this taco, <laughs> where, where are you? I know you're here somewhere. You see, I mean, this, this is why we practice to prepare for this transition. Or it's one of the reasons there's, of course, infinite reasons to practice, but you know, to, to, to know that, that death is among friends, that death is a familiar place to, to the spiritual, to those who have spent their life trying to sort out what is material and what is self, uh, that, that death is going to be a, a homecoming. You're going to look around and see all of the little trinkets that you've enjoyed at different periods in spiritual life over the years. You'll find them all there, you know, with you. Quite lovely. And so this idea, you know, if you do have that blessing of chanting the name of God, that, that purifies you in that last moment. And if you just, if you're dying, you know, it's like the elephant going into the stall. You're not going to get a chance to dirty up again. So your salvation comes to you. Your, your freedom comes to you at that moment. You know, but, but he, he, he's careful to say that, that, you know, it is always tied to some degree to your desire for freedom to your ideal, uh, to, to your efforts to realize that ideal. So there is some responsibility on our part. Tonkor says you do one, what is it, one sixteenth or something like that? We do one sixteenth, he's done 15 sixteenths already for us. And so uh, he'll make up the difference. You just have to, to uh, hold on to that, hold on to that deeply inside so that there's no doubt there's no fear at that point. Suppose a man becomes pure by chanting the holy name of God, but immediately afterward commits many sins. He has no strength of mind. He doesn't take a vow not to repeat his sin. A bath in the Ganges undoubtedly absolves one of all sin. But what does that avail? They say that the sins perch on the trees along the bank of the Ganges, no sooner does the man come back from the holy waters than the old sin jumps out of the trees and onto his shoulders. Everyone laughs. The same old sins take possession of him again. He is hardly out of the water before they fall upon him. Therefore I say, chant the name of God, and with it pray to him that you may have love for him. Pray to God for your attachment to such transitory things as wealth, name and creature comforts may become less and less every day you know and this this is the way we work you know it's not that you drop them all off in a single day and boom it's it's finished that's a lovely thing and if you can do that don't listen to me do it <laughs> but if not understand you know we're already covered by grace the presence of god is already within us our salvation, our, our, our freedom is already assured, you know, but from Takor and Ma and Swamiji and many others, you know. And so that's not the point. The point is, we, because of that, in inspiration from that, in gladness from that, and in a response to truth as we see it, we let go of these things. Little by little, we work through them. You know, so we don't, don't judge yourself. Don't be harsh about yourself. Just keep going forward. You know, that, that beautiful story about the brahmachari. Really take that to heart. If you fall, if you mess up, if you make a mistake, apologize for it. Bring it, bring it directly to mother, not with any shame, you know, but, but with just an acknowledgement. I made a mistake. This isn't what I want. And then you just go forward. You set it down immediately. You don't look back at it. And uh, you just determine, I'm starting again. We're going to try again. And you just, you just go. Just like that. With sincerity and earnestness, one can realize God through all religions. The Vaishnavas will realize God, and so will the Shaktas the Vedantists and the Brahmos, the Muslim and the Christian will realize him too. All will certainly realize God if they are earnest 
and if they are sincere. So when we talk about the top three most important things, one of the truth or this, this sincerity and earnestness is always in that list. Because Dr. says, if you're sincere and earnest, God himself will take responsibility for getting you, getting you to the goal. You know, he says, it's just like when you walk outside, if you're looking for, if you're earnestly looking for the grocery store, you may have no idea where it is, but in your earnestness, you'll ask and people will point the way and eventually you'll get to the grocery store. And so that's, that's our earnestness, the ability to ask questions, the ability to get up and try again, the ability to apologize and take refuge in grace, refuge in love. This is all earnestness. Just to, to not hold our own failings against ourselves, but to let them become part of the unreal past and move on. Move on, ever free, ever pure, ever clean, just going forward. You know, this, is, this is how we go. Some people indulge in quarrels, saying one cannot attain anything unless one worships our Krishna, or nothing can be gained without the worship of Kali, our divine mother. Or you cannot be saved without accepting the Christian religion. This is pure dogmatism. The dogmatist says my religion alone is true and the religion of others is false. This is a bad attitude. God can be reached by different paths. All right, there it is. If you need a, a place to mark in your book where Tucker says this, here it is. This paragraph lays it out quite clearly. Furthermore, some say that God has form and that he is not formless. Thus, they start quarreling. A Vaishnava quarrels with the Vedantist. One can rightly speak of God only after one has seen him. He who has seen God knows really and truly that God has form and that he is formless as well. He has many other aspects that cannot be described. Once, some blind men chanced to come near an animal that someone told them was an elephant. They were asked what the elephant was like. The blind man began to feel its body. One of them said that the elephant was like a pillar. He had touched only its leg. Another said, no, it's like a winnowing fan. He had touched only its ear. In this way, the others, having touched its tail or belly, gave their different versions of the elephant. Just so, a man who has seen only one aspect of God limits God to that alone. It is his conviction that God cannot be anything else. So this is really a, a, a lesson and an invitation to open your mind, <laughs> to really hold yourself ignorant. No, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't talked to God. I haven't seen God. What do I know? I'm doing my best. I'm going forward. Come along with me. Let's do this. You know, it's, it's this not having to provide answers, not having to say, this is the way it is. That is the way it is. Uh, that's such a hubris, a pride. That's, that's a real working of the ego. And so for us, just to go forward, God will show us all of these things in time. What is the most important thing? Love. Are you loving? Are you unselfish? That's what you pay attention to. Whether God has eight arms or five, or whether he is man or woman, or some mixture of both, or none at all, or all of it and others. What do you know? What do I know? Yeah, we can mimic Takor. We can repeat his words. You know, we can, you know, teach the words of Jesus. That doesn't mean we know anything. That means we know the words of Jesus. That means we know the teachings of Thakur or Buddha. But to see it, to know it, that's our task. And until then, be open to everything. Be kind about everything. Be loving toward everyone. And if they ask you for a teaching or if they ask you for some advice or if they ask you what you think, share it joyfully, lovingly. And then be sure and listen to what they think. And hear their story of God, hear their idea of what this divine experience is, and worship with them from their perspective and, again, from your own perspective. It is the same beloved. You know, so I always feel like as Vedantists, 
our, our goal when we sit down with somebody is first to ask enough questions, sincere questions, to be able to find out where they're standing, to be able to find out what their perspective is, to, to find out what makes their ideas about the divine tick. And as soon as you've asked enough questions, and as soon as you've, you've gotten a good idea of where they're at, and then you've started to practice seeing God from their perspective, so that you can understand it and you can sense their devotion and its sources. Then at that point, if they ask a question or need to know more or you have something more to share, then you can move forward together. Teaching is never unidirectional. You know, somebody, somebody this week sent me an email and asked me, you know, how, how could they help with my, with my spiritual practice or my spiritual life? And it's, it's, it's like, it's already happening. You know, you are already helping my practice, you know, by giving me an opportunity to talk about these things and to hear mother share these things, you know, through my own mind. I, I honestly, I honestly, I, I don't know what to think about this stuff, but I tell people, you know, I learn just as much from our time together as, as others tell me they learn from our time together. It's like, because it's mother who is our teacher. It's the divine that is our guru. And so any time where we spend this, it may look like I'm teaching you. God forbid <laughs> that that be the case. Because what do I know? You know, who am I for this? This is our togetherness in the presence of the beloved. And all of us are growing and all of us are learning. And all of us are being made wiser simultaneously that, yes, my words are affecting you, but you affect me. You know, teaching in this world, God is always going all directions simultaneously. It's never one direction. It's never in one way. You know? And so always remember that you, you are a great inspiration to the people around you. And you are a powerful tool in, in the hands of the Divine Mother. Don't let your ego measure itself and find you wanting, because the, the ego will always leave out the beloved and measure it for its own sake. You know? But for us, it's never us alone. It's us and the presence of the Divine. And whatever you're lacking, that presence makes up for. So be bold in your love. Be, be courageous in your acts of love. You know? Be fearless. <laughs> Borrow on that grace. Borrow on that faith if you don't have it enough right now. Assume that you have it. Assume that you're pure. Assume that you're free. Even though your ego wants to hold you in bondage, assume this freedom and go. Because we're all going home. We're all moving forward. And all of us will say at some point have an opportunity to have a roarous, raucous laugh over this whole adventure that we're on right now, these times. We'll remember these days like our days in college or our days in elementary school. And we'll laugh heartily about our failings and what we thought to be true and how much we loved these little trinkets, our teddy bears and our <laughs> whatnots as we've passed through this life. Always hold your mind in that place is what Takor is showing us. Always know it's already done. You're already home. Now enjoy the journey. You know, Enjoy the company of the beloved. Enjoy the manifestations as they appear every moment you know, in a constant change, non-repeating story of love. Excuse me, Swamiji. Yes, Gita. So you said that we're already home. What does that yeah. mean? That means that just like what 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 Suzuki says in in the first chapter of his book, uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, he says we don't practice in order to realize God. We practice to realize that we are already realized. You know, there within you, <laughs> the truth is already living and already active. You already are experiencing the divine, 
but you haven't placed your mind there. You haven't placed your attention there. Your attention is distracted in, in thought, distracted in ideas and story. So you're unaware of this part of you that is enjoying the bliss of God at this very moment. Within you in that silent shrine right now is the anahata sound, is, is, is the presence of love, the presence of the divine, the immortal self, ever pure and ever free and ever blissful. You don't have to do any of those things. They already exist within you. But the part of you that is enjoying that, the part of you that is sitting in that presence right now, is a part that you have not yet placed your attention on, that you have not yet paid attention to. Your attentions are lost in a wrong idea of yourself, in a suffering idea of yourself, in a limited idea of yourself, a small idea of yourself. And you can't, you can't enjoy that part of you until you let go of the lesser part of you. <laughs> until you move your sense of being from the changing noisy mind into the very still and eternally silent shrine uh, that is the real you, that is the real home. So that's but, what it means. But mm -hmm. We still have to peel the onion, right? What's we that? Have to, uh, we have to do some work still. Like uh, we, uh, like you said, we're already home. But like they say, uh, peel the onion, no? No? Okay. Uh, there's not the thing is the way that you answer that question is going to be the karma you have to follow. Okay. That's why I don't want to say yes or no. If you if you say I still have to do these things, I still have to accomplish these things, then yes, in fact, you still have to do those things and accomplish those things. But if you can, for a moment, take the knife of grace and cut your karma. If you can actually give yourself permission in this moment to let go of your karma, then no, you don't have to do anything. This moment, you can have your realization. That's the promise. See, but it's our attachment that spoils that. It's our attachment. You know, I really got to see this when I, when I broke my leg. <laughs> Here we go, that story again. When I broke my leg, one of the interesting things was, aside from the fact that I had to put my own foot back on my leg, which was a very odd experience to have. But uh, as soon as I had finally put my foot back where it was and I had sort of lined it up so it wasn't at some bizarre angle, I was holding my own foot on with both my hands on my leg, okay? And the paramedics, the paramedics came and uh, they had cut my pant leg off and they had put a, a splint around my leg and they needed me to let go of my leg so that the splint could do its work and they could, you know, tighten the straps and all of that. So he told me, he said, okay, you can let go of your leg. I said, okay. <laughs> my hands didn't move. They didn't loosen at all. And he said, you can let go of your leg. And I said, I know, I know you told me that. I said, but my hands are not listening to me. I, they, I can't, I can't let go. I, I said, I, I, I get it, I want to. <laughs> and, they, and he chuckled and, and the, the two paramedics had to, to white knuckle my hands off of my own leg. I was not in charge. You see, and we're talking about a situation very similar to that right now. It's like our belief in our karma is very strong. And our attachment to maintaining our story of being is very strong. And so because our minds have been so distracted, because our minds have been traveling in so many directions simultaneously for so long, we can no longer gather enough of our mind to make a statement, a unified statement of will. We can only gather this little bit up here that we're that we keep around us in consciousness, and that's not enough to get us to let go of our broken leg. You know, there's a whole lot of mind down below that has been spending a lot of time and lots of lots of whatevers uh, in its distraction, and when it, when when the conscious mind says let go of the leg, 
the, the subconscious mind is like, nah, <laughs> I'm going to hold it. That's better that way. I feel safer holding my own leg. I feel safer this way. I'm going to keep it this way. And because, because we believe that, we're stuck and our and our and our hands have to be pried off of our own off of our own soul as it were and so no all of this stuff is not necessary and at the same time it is but only because we won't let go of our story only because we won't forgive ourselves only because we won't allow us to end our karma we won't allow our story to, to be reduced to just the moment. And so it's a question for you to answer. Trust in grace, trust in, in unconditioned love, and you're free. Throw your eggs in that basket. But whatever the situation is, know that that is still true. You are still realized in this moment. You are still free in this moment and just do the work necessary to realize that over time just keep going forward just keep chipping away at it you know and if by grace one day you just for some reason get enough faith in grace to say this is done into your hands i'm coming you know then in that moment it will be yours in that moment it will be yours but don't fret. It's just a matter of time. You don't have to win a race. Just finishing will get you there. <laughs> and all of us are going to finish. Right. Thank you, Swamiji. Sure. Yeah. Swami. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a question. So um, this experience, you, you say, uh, Suzuki explained, and you just elucidated very well. Um could we say that the the infant's attachment and experience of its mother is somehow analogous so that a child before an infant before they can speak um any language while they're they're still aware they can see and smell their mom um has the experience that we are seeking Hmm. I don't know. Uh, sometimes I wonder, because you look into a child's eyes, and sometimes you see you see things very differently there. I, but who knows? I don't think that's an answerable question, because <laughs> I, I I can't have any remembrance of my own mind as a newborn child. There is some entanglement, because some entanglement caused that soul to take a body and to knit it together in the womb of the mother and to be born uh so there is some some interest there uh in in being here in 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 having this path available to them um so there is some delusion going on but i think also you know in, i know in christianity there's this firm belief that that if you if you pass away uh before the age of of I don't know, of knowing good from evil, knowing right from wrong, that if you pass away before that time, that uh, at least the church I went to believed that, that you were saved, you know, that you had your salvation. Um, <laughs> those seem like such strange ideas to me at this point in my life. But uh, I, I think it's something like that, though, you know, that they're not aware of their ignorance at that point, and they're there. And so I, I think they get you know, uh, we'll, we'll go with the Christian idea that they get free tickets <laughs> at that mm -hmm. moment. Um, you know, but, but really at, at the end of the day, uh, all of this is make believe. So what are you going to believe that is stopping you from your realization? If everything is make believe, except for that one truth, you know, it's like, this is why we meditate. That to, to sort out these things in our mind, to sort out uh, this confusion that we have. This is the reason that we practice witnessing that we within, seeing the mind, watching how it works, looking for its patterns, looking for its triggers, 
uh, paying attention to how it reacts to the senses, you know, so that we can learn to see that all of this is mechanized, that this is not because we love cherry cake, you know, that, that this is all mechanized. And as soon as we come to realize, wow, this is just a, a giant cog, <laughs> you know, this is just a giant machine that I'm stuck in right now, uh, simply because I, I think that it's me. You know, in India, um, in India, I saw all of these uh, elephants that were chained to trees in the courtyard of this temple down in, in Mysore. But none of the chains were, were locked. They were just laid around the base of the tree. And I said to the Swami, I was like, look, somebody forgot to lock the chains <laughs> on, the, on the elephants. And the Swami laughed. He said, no, 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 they only chained the baby elephants. He said, but after that chain, after that elephant has grown up, the elephant, as soon as you put a chain around its foot, it assumes that it's locked to the tree and it won't even try to get away, won't even try to get away from that tree. And so this, this is kind of our situation, you know, it, and this is why we practice. I mean, in our meditation, we sit there and tug at the chains, <laughs> find, out, find out if they're locked or not. You know, we sit there and, and look to, to understand uh, the limitations of mind and how it's just a bunch of repeating patterns of thinking uh, that we've called a personality and that we've identified as being ourself. But in fact, we're, we're all personalities, you know, that, that we're all bodies. And we can see how easily we, we change and take them on just by our dreaming. You know, dreaming to me, I, I love to think about it because there's so many spiritual insights that come from dreaming. When you dream, you take on a new body. And look how easily you do it. You don't question it at all. You just got a new body. And not only that, but you have forgotten everything about the daytime body. You've, you've left it all behind. And how easily you've done that. You don't even wonder, where, where, where did all my memories go? <laughs> you don't even wonder. And this body, this new body has new, has different abilities, but you just accept them. You just, you just start doing them, you know? And, and so you can see the nature of the self. Think about who is it that moves into the daytime body when it wakes up and accepts it perfectly, accepts its memories, accepts its limitations and its capabilities, its, its gender and all of these things and all of its story, just accepts it like that but then goes to sleep and becomes something entirely different and accepts that completely as easily. So what we're trying to do is take away the dream body because obviously that's not you because you can have one in the dream and you can have a waking body too. And they're both equally your own. So, so take everything away. Take away the daytime body. It's obviously not necessary to your sense of being because here you are in the dream without it. And you're still having a full sense of being. So try and isolate and understand that sense of being is what you are. That isness, that satchit ananda is what you are. And it's independent of a body. It's independent of a mind, which doesn't mean it doesn't have one. It means that it can have any of them and all of them. You are the eternal self. You are the everybody in the, in the bed. You are every character in the dream. You can't even argue with that. Even, even logically, you're like, yeah, that's true. Where else are those characters coming from? It's in my own mind, my own dreaming mind. But the important thing is to see how you can take your sense of self and apply it to anything. Apply it to anything. Take the waking body, take the dreaming body. Become a dog in your dream, become a dragon in your dream, become a flower in your dream, take no body in your dream, just be a point of reference in your dream, you know, and how easily we accept all of that. You know, my, my little experience with Moksha Prana, I looked at, you know, in that little dream that she placed me in, I, I looked down, there was no body. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> there's a stool, but there's nobody sitting on the stool. What is this? You see, see your sense of self can attach to anything. That's exactly why we call it attachment. You attach it to this body for now. This body will wear out. And then you wake up, in a sense, into another body. 
and you accept that one and you forget all about this one. You forget all of its stories, all of its memories, all of its events, and you take up a new body, you know, and it unfolds and you attach to that. And so now you're playing in that body in this dreamland. And so here we are, round and round we go. But the answer is plain and clear to us. We can see it every time we fall asleep and take on a new body. We have an opportunity to say, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Who am I that can be anybody? Who am I that can have any set of memories? Who am I that can have any set of thoughts and be perfectly at home with them as if they were my own? You know, detach from the particular and understand that you are the pure potential of all. You can be any of them and perhaps have been all of them at some point or another. Well, not maybe, because that self is the only self there is. That self is all of them right now, right? That you is playing all the parts in this world. This is our secret. This is our riddle. And we can know it in mind as a thought. But can you know it as yourself? Can you let go of all other thoughts that limit you? that tell you a story and whisper in your ear about your weakness, about your gender, about your age, about your shortcomings, about your faith and lack of it. Can you hear all those stories and know that they have nothing to do with you? That they are a story among infinite stories that you are living right now in every body, in every body, dreaming or not at this moment. One can rightly speak of God only after one has seen him. He who has seen God knows really and truly that God has form and that he is formless as well. He has many other aspects that cannot be described. And this he that we're talking about is that he that can change from your daytime body to your dreaming body seamlessly. That self independent of both those bodies is the he in this paragraph. And when we say that he can have form or he can be without form, you demonstrate that. Your dream, you can have a form or no form. You can be anything in that dream. And that you have many aspects that can't even be described. You know, aspects beyond mind, aspects beyond words, beyond past, present, future, before, beyond subject, object. There is, there is no limit to you in your true self, in your unattached un identity. <laughs> There's a riddle. Is there such a thing as an unattached identity? Once, oh, we just read about those guys feeling this thing. How can you say? that the only truth about God is that he has form. It is undoubtedly true that God comes down to earth in a human form, as in the case of Krishna. And it is true as well that God reveals himself to his devotees in various forms. But it is also true that God is formless. He is the indivisible existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute, he has been described in the Vedas both as formless and as endowed with form. He is also described there both as attributeless and as endowed with attributes. Do you know what I mean? Satchit Ananda is like an infinite ocean. Okay, this he's describing the you of you right now. He's describing that which changes from waking body to dream body. He's, he's trying to point out this, this mysterious, attributeless self, you know, that is only difficult for us to see because it lacks attribute. You see, all of our sense of self comes from attachment to attribute, attachment to particular. And if you take away your particulars, what are you? What language can describe you? 
you see, because you're either all of it or none of it. Both of them are equivalent statements. But how will you find that? How will you touch that? You know, how can you identify that which is unidentified? You see, so this is, this is why realization is so difficult for us because we've always been attached and we've always used those attachments to express and say and do everything. But those attributes are meaningless. They are unreal and they change even as we're sitting here, they are changing. But how do we let go? We let go by taking refuge, which means letting go. Of, it's, it's walking away from the battle. We change through, we, we realize through neti neti, understanding, no, I'm not just that attribute. No, I'm not just that mind. No, I'm not just that body. Little by little, we undo our hypnotization, our attachment to the particulars. And as those become looser and looser, and as they begin to rattle a little bit more around, we begin to understand they're not real. Like, wow, look at that. You know, I remember that when I, again, when I broke my foot, broke my leg rather, I was laying there and I was pondering one day how odd it was that I had broken my body. My body had never been broken. And to think, wow, it's, it's just like a dish. You know, it's just like a glass. It can break. It's an object. It's a thing. And I, and I took a look at that and I thought, look, my body is broken, but I have no sense of being broken. I don't feel any different right now than I felt when my leg was perfectly fine. So I am not broken. I cannot be broken. But the body can break. And that was so helpful to see that distinction, to see that this body is material. It's a piece of clay. You know, it can break. It's an object. But even when it breaks, I still feel completely me. You know, I, I thought I took that further and started thinking, I wonder how much of my body I can cut off before it doesn't function anymore. And do I diminish as an arm is removed? No. I would still be the same self. I would still be me, completely and wholly. It's just that I wouldn't have an arm to use anymore for my story. You know, then take your leg, take two legs and two arms. Then it starts getting rather odd, you know, but you will remain the same. You do not diminish with each limb being left, being taken away. So how can you think that you're the body? If you were in fact the body and you lost a, a leg, that would be a fourth of yourself that would be gone and you would feel it and you would know it. But the fact is you don't feel it and know it when it happens. The fact is, you know and can see in plain daylight that you are not this body, but you won't accept it because it's the best answer you've got going at this point. You don't know what to say. How can I be something with no attribute, with no limitation? Because that's what it means to be infinite, to have no limitation. And here you have been, you have built an entire life out of your limitations, out of your restrictions. So how are you going to imagine what it is to have none? Well, you can't. This does not happen in the mind. This is something that supersedes all of that and has always been true and will always be true, regardless of whether you're aware of it or not. That's why we, that's why we, we, we practice to realize that we have always been realized. We have always been. Do you know what I mean? This Satchitananda is like an infinite ocean. Intense cold freezes the water into ice, which floats on the ocean in blocks of various forms. Likewise, through the cooling influence of bhakti, one sees forms of God in the ocean of the absolute. These forms are meant for the bhaktas, the lovers of God. But when the sun of knowledge rises, the ice melts. It becomes the same water it was before. Water above and water below. Everywhere, nothing but water. Therefore, a prayer in the Bhagavata says, O Lord, you have form 
and you are also formless. You walk before us, O Lord, in the shape of man, and again, you have been described in the Vedas as beyond words and thought. You see, this is your story. This is you. You are walking among all of us right now with a body and a mind. And there was a time when you were formless, when you had not this body and not this mind. And you walk freely, but you haven't learned yourself yet. You haven't known that this story is about you. <laughs> All right. We're going to stop there for the evening. It's eight o'clock. And let me turn off the recorder here. Thank you so much, Swami.